our next speaker. His name is Richard Brady. He is an engineer at CoinBooth at Trustless. <laughs> he has integrated FreeSwitch into multiple UK mobile and fixed line networks using SIP. He has explored how Bitcoin and blockchains can be used in telecom. And he'll be talking with us today about integrating BIP, BIP70, Bitcoin Payment Protocol. His talk is titled Paying for Calls with Bitcoin over SIP and Drock.io. Please give a warm welcome and round of applause to Richard Brady. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Travis. Uh, a bunch of those details actually changed, um, but obviously the update never made it to you, but it's all good. So um, uh, my name is Richard Brady, and I think this is my first conference talk ever. I can't remember ever doing one, so I think this is, this is my first one. Um, the, na the name you see on the screen, Trustless, is a new journey I've embarked upon um, to explore blockchain and uh, telecom. The title of my talk is Paying for Calls with Bitcoin over SIP. Uh, first, however, I want to talk a bit about trust and, uh, and friction and the role that they play online. Um, I'll then show how cryptocurrency can help to reduce these negative factors. I'll give a brief demo and walk you through how it works. And I'll finish up by talking a bit about the role of blockchain in the future of telephony. Um, our industry, like many others, is permeated with trust and friction. What do I mean by these terms? Well, let's take the sign-up process and onboarding process for Skype as an example. Um, an example of trust is having to trust them with my phone number when I sign up. An example of friction is having to choose yet another password. And then when I try and choose that password, being told that it needs to have eight characters, two lowercase, two uppercase, two numbers, two symbols. Trust is also needing to provide my name and my date of birth. And friction is having to enter all of these things and then wait for a one-time authentication code, which I enter back into the browser, which I've received over SMS. I also have to trust them with my address and, of course, my credit card details and $8.39. So by the time I'm looking at a dial pad and ready to make my first phone call, I've had to trust Skype with a whole whack of personal data and a bit of money. What could go wrong? So I don't know, has anyone in the audience actually been affected by the Equifax hack? I'm not from the US, so, okay, that's interesting. So we heard some interesting points from Moshi on Tuesday about the potentially dubious intentions of corporations and a retort from Mr. Bodhi uh, that they are sufficiently disincentivized from uh, bad behavior. But as Equifax demonstrated, it's not just malice that we should be worried about, it's also negligence. And on the point of friction, our community isn't exactly doing much better. I recently got presented with this message when signing up for a UK VoIP provider of the kind that I used to work for. It reads, you should receive your personal start, letter, uh, start code letter in the post within a few short days. Phone calls will be unavailable until then. So all of this led me to ask, whatever happened to this thing? To use a payphone, or as we call it in the UK, a phone booth, you simply insert money make a call, and get your change. There is no need to hand over personal information, and you certainly don't need to choose a password before you can make a phone call. This is something I think would be great to reproduce in the browser, on the internet, I hope you will agree. Why is this so hard online? Well, it turns out that when trying to reproduce this experience online, a lot of the trust and friction arises from the need to take payments. Payphones accept cash, an irrevocable peer-to-peer -peer medium of exchange, and for a long time, there was no equivalent of cash on the internet. Our existing payment systems, such as credit cards, are not peer-to-peer, -peer, but rely on trusted third parties, and they simply cannot function without the trust and friction that I demonstrated earlier. Enter peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. Trustless, permissionless, frictionless payments from anyone connected to the internet to anyone else, uncensored and irrevocable. So can I see by a show of hands uh, who in the audience has uh, tried out Bitcoin or another cryptocurrency? Okay, that's good to know. Cryptocurrencies can help us solve this problem, and today I'll be comparing Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, and Ethereum. As, uh, and I'll be comparing them in, t in, in the sort of context of three different approaches uh, uh, to payments. The first being a, a prepaid account system, which is something that should be familiar. And the second being micropayments, which can be done either on-chain or off-chain. 
So operating a prepaid account system would be familiar to many of you in the room today. This is a matter of taking prepayments from the customer, storing them as a credit against an account, and they can then draw down on that credit. The difference between this and traditional payments is that we can remove the trust element around personal data because we can take a prepayment from a customer without needing to know anything about them. And we have no risk of clawback. This is an immediate win. Unfortunately, Bitcoin today is prohibitively expensive due to congestion on the network, with transaction fees often in the tens of dollars. It's also slow because double spends of unconfirmed transactions are allowed. Bitcoin Cash, on the other hand, has an increased block size resulting in sub cent transaction fees, and they've disallowed double spends of unconfirmed transactions, meaning that we can actually rely on these transactions as soon as we see them on the network. So Bitcoin Cash gives us cheap and pretty much instant uh, payments, which is uh, really powerful. Ethereum is uh, somewhere in the middle. It's not quite as expensive or as slow as, as uh, Bitcoin main chain at the moment, but uh, it's certainly not as cheap or as fast as uh, Bitcoin Cash. So we actually we, I started working with, uh, with sort of doing Ethereum-based uh, prepaid account model. And uh, we've, uh, we've started some development on that. But we've also got quite excited about micropayments as well. So uh, I'll talk a bit about that in a bit. Pros and cons of this prepaid, prepaid account system. Well, you don't need a user interaction per call. So if a, if a customer's got credit with you, you don't need to ask them for a new payment every single call, which is great. But obviously, they've got a, an amount of money which is on deposit with you. So there's some residual trust there. That you're still sitting with $10 of their money. And they're trusting you not to change the price of calls or uh, to disappear overnight. Um, all right. So then we have micropayment, uh, micropayments, which is the idea of doing these really small payments on a per call or per minute basis. And this is where we get to use that 402 payment required response code. I've been uh, uh, sort of uh, keep noticing this 402 payment required response code when I read the HTTP RFC or the SIP RFC. And it's, uh, it says reserved for future use, I think. And it's just sort of begging to, uh, to be played with. So if you, if, if you can do payments on a per request basis, then the 402 payment required response code is, is definitely uh, the thing to use for it. So Bitcoin for micropayments, definitely not an option. Uh, you know, you're not going to spend $10 in fees to, to pay $0.05 cents in uh, call usage. Um, Bitcoin Cash is actually still feasible for micropayments because the, the fees are sub-cent. And Ethereum is also just too expensive for this sort of thing. So, okay, time for a demo because I've been talking way too much. Uh, I have a number here. And so this is Coinbooth. This is a... Demo that I've knocked up um, with uh, Bitcoin Cash. Um, I'm not much of a developer myself, so I've got uh, some guys that are working on the pretty version that you saw a bit earlier, and that's working with Ethereum. But I really wanted to use this 402 payment required and get a demo. Giovanni's in the room. Um, okay, so uh, let's enter a number. Refresh the page. Uh, okay. It is an expensive uh, service. I'm hoping to make lots of profit. So there you go. So it's uh, you can see over here, you've, you've got a 402 payment required message. I'll show you a bit more about that in a bit. Unfortunately, links aren't working for Bitcoin Cash URIs in my browser at the moment. But I can just copy and paste that link. So I'm going into a Bitcoin wallet now. And I am making a payment. So that's broadcasting a Bitcoin payment to the network. It says payment sent. Um, that's gone to the Bitcoin Cash Network. And on the back end, there's a wallet which is listening for it. I can come back here and say that I've paid. Will you get that, boat? Hello. How you doing? So there you go. And you've got a bit of a countdown at the bottom there telling you how much time you got left. So cool. Thank you very much. So that's just a basic demo of what a, what a call looks like. And that was paid for with Bitcoin Cash, and it was done using a 402 payment required. Um, and I'll uh, show you a bit about what that looks like. So that was the invite message. 
Um, we all know what an invite looks like, but the one at the bottom might be a little bit less familiar. So that's the 402 payment required response code. And actually, all you need to do is very much like a, an authentication challenge. You just drop a header in there. So we dropped the XPay header in there. I think the X prefix is deprecated, but we had some issue uh, adding headers, which didn't include it. Um, and so that's the Bitcoin Cash URI, which is a Bitcoin uh, wallet address. And it's got a bit of extra information, including uh, an amount that needs to be paid and an authorization token that needs to be provided. Um, so once we've made that payment, we then reissued the invite and we include that authorization token, which was in the, uh, in the previous message. So you can see on the bottom there, uh, it says authorization token type bearer, and you just include that as a header in the new invite message, and then it can, uh, can do a lookup against that. You can't use the Bitcoin address itself as the authentication token because that address has been broadcast to the network and someone could listen to all transactions and use it to brute force uh, your system. So that's a basic overview of what the architecture looks like. Um, pretty standard uh, um, VoIP infrastructure, WebRTC sort of uh, model uh, with a web backend and a VoIP backend. Only difference there is what you see at the top with a, a, a Bitcoin wallet and, uh, and a blockchain element. So the, uh, the VoIP backend, we used uh, Dractio, which has had a couple of mentions uh, this week, which is fantastic. I think uh, it was Dan Jenkins and who else spoke about Dractio? Definitely had some, some mention, which was great. Um, it's a Node.js framework for SIP applications. The idea being to get as much of the logic for call routing into JavaScript land so that you can leverage all the goodness of Node and your favorite NPM packages. It's worth checking out, especially if you're a JavaScript developer. And then the other thing that we've used there, which is a bit different, is uh, Electron Cash, which is a thin client a Bitcoin Cash wallet. Um, and that's how we are uh, taking those payments. So I'll first start by just talking a little bit about Dractio. Um, it uh, is really sort of uh, very similar to the way ESL would work. Um, the only difference really is that it's also a framework on the, on the Node side. So if you're in uh, JavaScript land and, and your Node application actually has a framework to work with, and it's called a middleware framework, or it, it uses the middleware pattern, which is basically the idea of passing a stack of uh, functions um, to be used as handlers. And these functions then each get to process something like an invite, and then they hand it off to the next function. So here we've got set logger, um, which is a, a logging um, function, and then validate call and payment. And so basically this invite object gets passed between all of these uh, um, uh, functions, and then uh, they, each one of those then calls the next uh, method, uh, and it gets passed into the next one. So it's a really cool uh, development uh, pattern. Um, highly recommend checking out Dractio. And then uh, Electron Cash, as I mentioned, uh, simplified payment verification means you don't need to download the whole blockchain. And it's a hierarchical deterministic wallet, which means it generates these uh, public-private key pairs as Bitcoin addresses, and you can generate infinitely many of them. So you can generate a new Bitcoin address for every single payment that you're taking, um, which uh, can be very useful if you're trying to tell which customers sent, uh, sent money to you. Um, it uh, has a JSON RPC interface, so you basically send uh, requests like uh, get address or check balance, uh, and it sends back uh, the information to you like that. So uh, I've got a ladder diagram here, which is pretty boring, but what I did think I would do is show the Bitcoin payment on the network. So for anyone who uh, hasn't seen a block explorer before, you can go and look at that payment that's been sent. And uh, anyone can see that payment. So it's out there on the blockchain. It's been published. And so this is a basic Bitcoin Cash transaction. It has a transaction ID, which is a hash. Um, it has inputs and outputs. Um, and the reason you're seeing two outputs here is that one of those is actually change. So every time you spend money from an address, you actually have to spend all the money, uh, not in that, address, in that address necessarily, but you have to spend all the money in the previously unspent transaction output that you're spending. It's basically like a long linked list or directed acyclic graph of transactions. So over here, I had, uh, let's have a look. I had $12.44 in, uh, in that address or the equivalent thereof. I sent five cents to Coinbooth and I sent $12.38 back to myself. Um, and so when I did that, I also used a new address. So I didn't send it back to my own address uh, or back to the sending address. I actually used a, uh, a newly issued address from that um, SPV uh, generator. 
So that's a Bitcoin uh, cash transaction on the blockchain. Let's keep moving. Pros and cons of this approach. So that was basically a micropayment, a per call micropayment, but it was done on chain. So basically that transaction was broadcast to the chain. It's simple and it's cheap. That's basically the, the, the advantages of this method. It does have some disadvantages. It requires low cost transactions. We don't know how much longer we're going to have those for because they didn't last last time. Uh, you do have some propagation delay. So that, you know, the, um, you're, not, you're never quite sure how long it's going to take for, uh, for the transaction to be seen by the uh, provider, um, but propagation delays are, are typically sub-second or on the order of seconds, which is really good. Um, but it's just not great for a request response because as you might have seen, uh, the server sent the 402 challenge and then it didn't get a response to the challenge. It just got a new invite and then it went and checked the blockchain to see if the address associated with that token had been paid and then it said, uh, okay, it has. So it's not really suited to request response. So then we get to the really exciting bit, which is this off-chain micropayments. Um, and I'm going to try and explain this, so uh, stick with me. Off-chain micropayments allow you to uh, uh, allow a sender and a receiver of money to open a channel between them with an on-chain transaction. So they broadcast something to the chain, which basically uh, opens a channel, and then they can exchange off-chain digital signatures. And this is perfect for request response because uh, I can challenge you for uh, a bit of money and you can send the transaction or the signature back to me in your response. You don't need to broadcast it to the blockchain. I don't need to wait to, for it to propagate. So uh, if a sender and a receiver, as you can see on the screen, want to uh, exchange money, they create an escrow account, which is basically a multi-signature wallet. Um, it's an address that requires two signatures in order to spend from it. So the sender and the receiver both need to sign for money to be released from escrow. It's not like escrow in the traditional sense where you have a mediation process. The only way to release money is for both the sender and the receiver to sign it. So the sender <coughs> sends a off-chain transaction to the receiver and uh, says, uh, and that transaction opens a channel with uh, a certain amount of money. So here I've got 0.1 Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash. There's a thing called end lock time in Bitcoin, which is a way of saying this transaction is not valid until some time in the future. So this, there's no point in broadcasting this transaction until say one hour or one day in the future because it's, uh, it will get rejected by the network. But uh, that refund transaction is a transaction which spends from the escrow address. The receiver signs the transaction so the send and sends it back to the receiver. So now the uh, sends it back to the sender, so that the sender has a refund transaction, which gives him the confidence to go and deposit 0.1 Bitcoin into the uh, escrow multi-signature address. And when they do so, they send some change back to themselves, which is pretty standard, as I showed. They can now exchange these off-chain transactions. So here, the sender is sending the receiver a very small amount of money, 0.01 Bitcoin Cash. Uh, or Bitcoin, and uh, the receiver s c uh, hangs on to that, doesn't broadcast it to the network. Uh, a bit later, if the sender wants to make another phone call, for example, they send another update like that. And at the end of all of this, when the receiver is ready to close down the channel or uh, the service uh, uh, is no longer being consumed, they simply broadcast the last update transaction down there to the network at the top, and that spends the money to themselves and sends the change back to the sender. So that's basically the idea of a, uh, of a payment channel, and it's extremely powerful and very exciting. And of course, if the receiver doesn't actually broadcast that transaction, which sends the change back to the sender, if, if the receiver uh, halts or disappears or anything like that, then the sender has this time-blocked transaction. They simply need to wait a couple of hours or a day or whatever it may be, and they can then broadcast the refund transaction and get uh, all of the money back effectively. So this is really powerful and, and uh, really suited to uh, request response transactions. It's what's being done on uh, the Bitcoin network uh, with something called Lightning. Um, it's uh, currently in beta, but has limited adoption. Uh, it's possible on Bitcoin Cash, but there's not much happening in terms of active projects. And there's a lot of very interesting stuff happening around uh, off-chain microtransactions on the Ethereum project. And again, that's something that we're looking at. So, uh, you, you, you know, in a user interface, you'd have something like this, where you've got a certain amount of funds actually locked up in a channel, and then you can have the spending completely off-chain. So now the 402 uh, payment required response can uh, provide a challenge for payment and the uh, caller or the user or their browser actually sends back in a response to that in the next invite they actually send back an off-chain microtransaction.
So that's something that uh, I think is very powerful and, uh, and very promising for, for the future. There is a bit of a challenge with this at the moment. If you're doing it in the browser, we have this amazing browser extension called MetaMask that helps us do all this kind of stuff. But if you want to do a microtransaction for every minute or every call, that requires a user interaction because it pops up and asks the user to confirm that they want to sign the transaction. So um, we'll see where that leads, but it's a very exciting technology. Off-chain micropayments definitely uh, have the lowest cost, the lowest trust, the lowest delay, and they are excellent for request response. The issues such as user interaction and complexity hopefully will be solved, um, and that's something that we're definitely looking forward to. So that's the kind of overall matrix of of different ways that you could pay for uh, for services and, and telephony in particular uh, with cryptocurrency. And uh, I'm hoping that we'll be able to color that bottom row in, in green soon um, and uh, work on, on micropayments and, and telecoms. Um, right, I think that just about wraps it up. Yeah, so maturity and adoption of micropayments, something to look forward to. The other thing uh, in terms of the future is digital identities, which I'm sure you might have heard of, and attestations. This is things like being able to prove your identity or, or prove ownership of numbers or prove your address, which will certainly, I think, give some reassurance to people who are concerned about the anonymity of this and the implications for law enforcement and, and regulation. So that's exciting. And then uh, perhaps one day calling between uh, digital identities. Um, so to round off... Um, I hope I've convinced you that trust and friction in business are negative properties, and I hope I've provided a case for trying to reduce them. Cryptocurrencies and blockchains provide some excellent tools for achieving that. My goal is to explore reducing these factors. Trustless doesn't have to mean zero trust. It can also mean trustless. I hope this talk will encourage you to think about using these tools in your business or project. And if you do, I'd love to hear from you. My email's on screen. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Richard. That was a wonderful talk. Do we have any questions for him while we bring up our next speaker? Yes. No questions? Cool. Any questions? No yeah. questions. One, one, one question bizarre. over there. I guess everyone just trusted you on your talk, so... <laughs> We got one there. So regarding like micropayments, it's still an issue with the blockchain technology. I mean, propagating the transaction. Uh, so it's still kind of slow. The other thing is, uh, and transaction fees as well. And the Do you mean the opening I, and closing transactions? Yeah. And, and the other thing I wanted to ask was, are you looking into anonymized currencies like Zcash? I mean, chains like Zcash or... Um, I mean, Personally, I'm, I'm actually only looking at those three cryptocurrencies. It's only, only so um, thin you can spread yourself. But uh, um, I am familiar with Zcash. And I've, you know, uh, it's a very interesting technology. Um, but when, when you start using anonymous cryptocurrencies, I think there's a bit of a balance to be achieved between um, reducing trust and friction and sort of uh, enabling uh, uh, bad actors or, uh, you know, one step at a time, I guess. Um, and there, there are, there are, if you're doing something like telephony, at the end of the day, you're sending the person's telephone call, probably unencrypted over the PSTN. So um, if someone needs privacy that badly or confidentiality that badly, they're probably not going to be use, using something like what I'm building. Um, and they're probably not going to be making the call between sort of uh, cryptographically traceable identities. But uh, it's certainly an interesting area. All right. Big thanks to Richard. Round of applause. Cool. Thanks. Yeah.